A very well-known Ethio-American personality, Burukailu is a professor of political science, international relations, and global mass media. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to our weekly Addis Dialogue. We will be spending some time with this distinguished professor talking about current issues in his home country, Ethiopia. Do stay with us. Professor, a very warm welcome to our weekly program at this dialogue. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shafarrao. It's, uh, it's really great to be on your show once again, and it's also nice to see you. Although Ethiopian authorities have time and again tried to explain the purpose of the law enforcement operation in the state of Tigray, most of international media outlets keep on telling the world a lopsided or distorted image of developments in Ethiopia. On the other hand, Ethiopian authorities do not seem to have done enough to counter the barrage of insults, if you like. What do you think should be done? Uh, as for the foreign media, it seems uh, really, uh, really, uh, I would say, uh, it was not well covered in a very objective and professional way. Uh, as uh, media and journalist people, they need to cover both sides as to what the Ethiopian government is saying and as to what the opposition is saying. Uh, in, in that regard, it means uh, they have failed. They have failed to uh, report objectively. Uh, all this has a reason. Uh, mm -hmm. It was, there was a certain expectation in outcome, I would say. Uh, the expectation uh, of the foreign media especially was that uh, the former ruling party of Ethiopia, the TPLF, uh, would win the war mm -hmm. uh, in a very dramatic way. And they were even expecting it, saying that they are battle-hardened, they had 40-plus years of experience, uh, and they were expecting that the federal government will be weakened and even maybe lose. And also, when we talk about the foreign media, the guys who are said to be authorities on Ethiopia, we could name them by names who even made a career out of uh, reporting and writing about um, Ethiopia and Ethiopian politics and the Horn for the last 35, 40 years. They were always looked up as a source, mm -hmm. as a source, as a source of uh, analysis, as a source of this. And guess what? Well, they don't have to guess, actually. Uh, the, 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 the saddest part is this few people who are always quoted by this, and the, I don't want to name names, the Western newspapers and medias, uh, their, their expectation will be TPLF would win. Mm -hmm. And also what we shouldn't forget is that they had a 35 to 40 years connection with the TPLF people. Mm. I mean, there was a certain bond. And they had always their sources from inside and their expectation that they would win. So uh, when they were asked, interviewed, or when they wrote about the current politics in Ethiopia, what happened in the north when the northern Ethiopian army, the northern command was attacked, uh, they only wanted to see things from their own point of view. Uh, so, by the way, that had uh, really resul re resulted in their uh, discredition. They, they lost credibility, I would say. On the Ethiopian government side, I'll be very short in that, in the Ethiopian government side, I think uh, uh, in the Western media especially, we need to sell ourselves. We need to do more of public relations. We need to really uh, provide information if not to the hour, at least one or two times a day, some kind of a press release, some kind of a press you know, communique should have been given, I think. Still on the issue, people think the TPLF has mastered the art of international relations and media, so much so that the diplomacy is going its way. Is that the TPLF's mastery or passive approach on the part of Arat Kilo? Um, one, th one thing is a fact. The fact is the PLF as a political force uh, in the Horn of Africa and in Ethiopia had impacted Ethiopian politics uh, as the ruling party, calling the shots uh, since uh, they came to power in 1991. And before that, they had a 17-year-plus experience in, let's say, lobbying the U.S. Congress, in uh, lobbying State Department, 
uh, in the disseminating information and facts the way they want to be presented. Uh, they had made their own networking and networks, which is still alive and kicking, uh, as we observe in America and the Western world. So all this added up, uh, to answer your question, had given them a certain degree of leverage. Mm. Now, in news, since I also teach in, in, in media and journalism, in news, uh, what you say and what you do, what you say needs to be backed by what you say. Uh, now, uh, the, those media people who are on the receiving end of the TPLF network are now questioning the truthfulness and the viability and the objectivity of the information that they readily are given by the TPLF uh, uh, networks and the like, especially the media section of the, the party itself. Ethiopian communities living in the United States of America, how concerned are you about your home country and do you follow up new developments in Ethiopia? Uh, very much so. As the saying goes, you know, uh, it's all Ethiopians, they carry Ethiopia in their hearts, wherever they live and wherever they are, as Mr. Zato Sifaro, as you know. Uh, Ethiopians passionately, on a daily basis, they look for search and for information, what's, what's, what's going on in their own country in Ethiopia. So I myself, you know, I'm concerned about the fate of my country and my people. You know, like any ordinary Ethiopian. Yes, so the community of Ethiopians, uh, I can only speak more so of the US-based Ethiopian diaspora community. They are very actively following what's going on in Ethiopia. Mm. And of course, different community organizations take different stands and they have different you know, positions. But the majority, at least I would say, is that they, their love for Ethiopia is unquestionable. They want the best for Ethiopia. They want peace and stability and economic progress in Ethiopia. They want democracy, a democratic system to be installed in Ethiopia. They want freedom of the press. Ethiop Americans in Ethiopia want rule of law. They want a, a constitution that's not on paper, but a constitution that works and functions and appropriate for Ethiopia. In that sense, uh, Ethiopians have organized themselves in community organizations like advocacy groups. I'm a member of uh, the biggest in the USA. We have 60, 70 advocacy groups and the lobby groups, like say the Ethiopian American um, um, Civic Council, uh, the Ethiopian Advocacy Network, and so on and so on. There are so many. The two are the largest in America. So what they, what this uh, community organizations do is that they want, they provide information to Congress, to Senate, to the House of Representatives, when there is a, a hearing on Ethiopia or a briefing on Ethiopia, they try to be there and try to give the American representatives and senators at least the facts and the objective facts about Ethiopia. Uh, in that respect, they, uh, the community has made progress. They also want to help Ethiopia as much as, 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 much as they want, like say COVID before the November 3rd and November 4th crisis occurred in Ethiopia, for instance. Most of us were involved in COVID, raising medical supplies, resources for Ethiopia. Uh, before it, and even now we are actively organizing, I have organized us, ourselves around the great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, uh, trying to mobilize support. If you recall in August, you know, uh, even America, suspension of aid for Ethiopia, and uh, we had to fight our way through, and try, you know, approaching the Trump administration, saying that that would be counterproductive for American policy and the like and the like. So we work in all fronts, uh, trying to bring about the betterment of our country. And also we would like to have economic uh, capital in investors, uh, uh, Americans, Ethiopian Americans or Americans, Americans to come to Ethiopia and invest in Ethiopia so that our, the country we love would progress further. So yes, the community is very active, is conscious, is following with interest what's going on most of the community now here in America are very hopeful. Yes, we are saddened by what had happened in the 3rd of November, the crisis, but also now we are relieved that the crisis is almost over and that life is back to, is back, back to normal. So we wish and we support the current government in Ethiopia, most of us. Why? Because we see the current government of Dr. Abiy Ahmed as one last hope for Ethiopia.
that will take Ethiopia across the bridge to a really true democratic system, a democratic order. We look forward to the to the election that will that is um, that has been scheduled for 2021, and we are here to provide civic education, uh, to do everything possible as much as as much as our energy, time, and money allows us to support the country that we left behind, but the country that still resides in our hearts. All right, Professor. Um, you know, in, in spite of TPLF's atrocities on innocent civilians, uh, international media outlets rant, uh, as you know, about lack of humanitarian assistance and substantiated accounts of human rights abuse, this and that. Some say this is the colonial mentality shaping or twisting their editorial policy. Uh, what's your take on that and do you agree? There was an incident, for example, in Tigray, where even the United Nations had asked for an apology, you might know, uh, as you might know, uh, Mr. Shifarro. Uh, the apology was that the, their, their staff, uh, two times they went to uh, uh, a restricted zone area without permit, and uh, any uh, um, law and order troops would ask uh, the following question. Do you have a permit for that? Where are you going? What's your objective? What's your goal? They couldn't answer, so they were stopped. The third attempt, as far as the United Nations also had uh, verified it, uh, they were shot at and they were stopped. And then the United Nations complained bitterly, agencies complained bitterly that the Ethiopian government is being very, very restrictive, which, and the Ethiopian government, of course, protested and said that this is a sovereign country. Uh, once there are theaters of warfare, war in different regions of Tigray, when one zone is cleared, then you will go there, you will be allowed there. And you cannot go wherever you want. It's not a playground because it's a war area. And uh, whatever loss of lives of the UN personnel, Ethiopian government will be responsible under international law for their safety. So the Ethiopian government protested. And finally, uh, the United Nations had their own investigators and admitted that they were wrong. So there, the two sides should work as partners. As to the media, the media also should work as partners. Therefore, humanitarian humanitarian uh, assistance uh, should be in Tigray, definitely. And I have seen reports that some uh, measures were taken, uh, reportage, news news items, news news items. I have also uh, followed. Uh, and the United Nations are now operating uh, as much as, uh, as, as, much as uh, the theater of operation allows them. And uh, I think uh, the United Nations should, uh, when they operate, they should do that in partnership with the host government. And the United Nations, by the way, they are not new to mm -hmm. such operations, you know, in peacekeeping, in disasters, in everything, 70 plus years of experience they have. Uh, but. Uh, but uh, I, I will also want to address one part of your question, the word the quote unquote colonialism, you know? Um, I mean, such things do not work in Ethiopia. Uh, first and foremost, we, we have we're never a colony, always a proud people and a free people. Uh, we feel uh, our so sovereign uh, sovereignty is our number one priority. And we expect, I think Ethiopians expect when whoever they, they are, institutions or groups or people who are in Ethiopia to abide by the rule of the, by, by the law of the country. Uh, if that is breached, I think the Ethiopian government uh, is serious to take actions. Uh, you know, whether this government, the past or the military or the, the, the monar monarchical systems that we have in Ethiopia for thousands of years, that was the principle of Ethiopians. You know, respect our country, territorial integrity, uh, you cannot break the door and come in. Uh, it might work in other countries. I don't know. Maybe it was tried, but in Ethiopia, such things is counterproductive. And I do hope that uh, international organizations, when they deal with Ethiopia, whether it's the European Union or the UN or any of governmental and non-governmental organizations, profit or non-profit organizations, to abide by the law, respect the sovereign rights of Ethiopians. Some media are still saying that Ethiopia is now at war. In your view, does this come from lack of information, or do you think that this is deliberate? It is both, I would say. 
Turkey is so huge and a nation. There is, I would say, peace in uh, some areas, even in the big chunk of the country, and there is lack of peace in others, and then uh, it will move to another. So that's how, uh, that's how the media should have seen it. You know, mm -hmm. when, you, uh, when one covers one nation, like say America, what's going on, crime or what, what have you, uh, sometimes when you read the reports, you feel as if uh, everywhere in America people are being mugged and there is no peace and order in America, but there is peace. There is, the, it is in such a way that the media should, should analyze. Yes, there was lack of peace, let's say, in November in Tigray. That does not mean that there is lack of peace everywhere in Ethiopia. Okay? And there was military confrontation and military crisis, and it was concluded with the federal government coming on top. That does not mean that there is war everywhere, that Ethiopia is going downhill. Look at the economy. Look at the economy. Life does not stop. There is export and import business going on. The people buy and there is the tip airlines going out and inside the country. You know, life goes on. We call it life goes on. And it, is be, it will be very, very wrong to take only one aspect, one region. It is sad, it's in problems. And to conclude and say, Nothing works. There is no peace at all in Ethiopia. It's, Ethiopia is going downhill. And that is what I observe uh, when the Western media especially uh, report about Ethiopia. Uh, the Ethiopian gov government, the current government uh, especially, I know is open uh, to discuss, open to talk, and even uh, explains the decisions and actions taken and the problems that we have in Ethiopia, you know, uh, sharing as partners, as strategic partners, but uh, when it comes to uh, maintenance of law and order, first comes us, us, I mean, I say Ethiopians and the Ethiopian government, which is still on top and which the Ethiopian government had succeeded, uh, no matter the difficulty and the challenge to maintain law and order in the majority, in the majority parts of Ethiopia. Okay. As to Tigray, life is coming back to normal, and we hope that uh, uh, total uh, peace and order will be maintained very much soon. For the sake of journalistic professionalism, do you think they need to apologize to Ethiopia for the news coverage they have erroneously made so far on Ethiopia? Uh, I'm glad you asked that. I, I am not sure uh, whether really, I could not be sure, better say, that Western media would apologize. Uh, and, and it is sad. Uh, in cases that they apologize, like I, I, I remember with the BBC, I think they apologized uh, when last month, maybe like the United Nations, but I'll, I'll come back to the exact, but it's regarding the reportage, you know, uh, and, and um, that shows you that, well, that media institution is remarkable, at, at least when they make mistakes, they apologize, and that will, believe it or not, enhance the credibility of that media organization, really, in the eyes of uh, their supporters in the eyes of the audience, in the eyes of Ethiopians as well, you know, if they do that. But most, they don't. Most, they don't. Uh, and, you know, the media nowadays uh, also is, by and large, uh, news items are based around so-called experts. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I'll say it again, they made their careers out of talking about Ethiopia and writing about Ethiopia. And uh, it is sad that the media, the Western media, always hangs on such people. I wish they come to Bahardar. I wish they come to Debratavo. I wish they come to uh, other universities, even Makaila universities, why not? And talk to Ethiopians themselves or normal citizens. I don't think that their, um, uh, their correspondents are stopped from doing that uh, in Ethiopia. Another thing is that most of this media, Mr. Worku, they report from Nairobi, uh, some reports from Cairo, some reports from London, from, from, from it, about Ethiopia, mind you. I mean, from thousands of miles, you know, I know it's, it costs, it has financially in, in cost, you know, air tickets, hotels and the like, but if they sincerely want to report about Ethiopia, they should be inside the country. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, as far as I know, the Ethiopian government did not say, no, foreign journalists don't come. They, they, they should apply, get their credentials, register with the law of the country, and start operating. They should do that. But uh, rather, they choose the easy way out. The easy way out is here again, hang on to certain individuals, and then ask them from London, from Oslo, 
from wherever they are, and then uh, make uh, erroneous, to use your word, erroneous conclusions and information about Ethiopia. So that needs to be really corrected. They should have their offices there in Ethiopia. At least they should send for three months, six months, temporary journalists to report about a certain crisis in Ethiopia, like now, for instance, okay? That's how I think it should be done. Yeah. As a political scientist, what is your view on EU posture on Ethiopia? We have a very, very, as far as I know, very strong relationships. The Europeans, they want Africa, the Caribbean, uh, that, uh, and other developed Asian countries to develop. In that respect, I think Ethiopia wants to economically and socially develop. Europeans wants to provide money to projects, uh, European taxpayers' money. In Ethiopia, with the, you know, with the European Union, uh, had worked smoothly together. But now, but now there is, to use your word, posturing. Uh, here again, I think that would not, it's counterproductive. It would not work on Ethiopia and Ethiopians. Uh, the European Union, they have their own way of seeing things, fine. Ethiopia respects that, and they should also respect the sovereignty of Ethiopia, I believe. They should really respect the sovereignty of Ethiopia. Uh, if one partner tries to dictate on the others, I think especially in Ethiopia here again, it might work in other countries. It doesn't work on Ethiopia. It's counterproductive. It would even, I would say, pollute the good relations that we have the Europeans. So I do hope that they come, out, come back, reassess their strategy, and uh, work on Ethiopia because uh, based on mutual interest and mutual benefit. The Horn of Africa is very volatile, Mr. Shafar, as you know. And the European Union is concerned about what's going on in the Horn of Africa and the African continent as well. Uh, they, have a, uh, uh, they have so many strategies, you know, to, to dam migration, migrants from Africa coming to the shores of southern parts of the European Union countries like Italy and the like, or Spain. Uh, European Union have a very good strategy to do what? To beef up, uh, to contribute money and projects to beef up, to create jobs in the respective African countries, inc including Ethiopia, and to build projects like bridges and infrastructure. That's what Africa needs. And I think Africa is thankful for that, to be honest with you, and also Ethiopia. And also Ethiopia, the money spent in Ethiopia is well spent in Europe itself, eventually. Mm. The money spent in Ethiopia is, by the way, a money worth spent because uh, I'm not saying Ethiopia is a 100% corrupt free country from thousands of miles away from America, but I can say is, and also reports from the European attest to the fact that when it comes to earmarked money for projects, at least the projects are implemented in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. They know that. They know that their money is not lost. Ethiopia is a strong partner from the security point of view and the political point of view, fighting terrorism, securing peace and order in the whole. Ethiopia is the center, the anchor of the whole turbulent Horn of Africa countries up to the Red Sea area. So Ethiopia is a key ally. So pushing a little bit back or maybe far, Ethiopia and Ethiopians is counterproductive and destructive to the policy of the European community. So uh, I do hope that this tactic, some even have called it arm twisting, should stop, should stop, because it will not be taken well by Ethiopia and Ethiopians, uh, and look for other options. And that is to continue friendship on a genuine, on a genuine platform, mutual respect. They might have the reservation, fine, and Ethiopia might have reservations, also fine. But there are so many common points that pull the two forces together. So they have much at stake, the European unions in Ethiopia, by being present in Ethiopia and by talking with the Ethiopian government. And I'm sure they will come back to their senses, senses and then continue these long-lasting relationships and uh, solidify these um, good relations that we have with the European Union. And I'm sure that the Europeans will, Brussels, would hear the response from the Ethiopian government and then re re reassess their position and come back. I'm sure of that. What's your take on the African Union and EGAS regarding Ethiopia? First and foremost, you know, if I start with the African Union, uh, you know, when there was the organization of African unity, that was 
from 1963 to 2000. Uh, that was not clear, but ever since the African Union, the Charter, the consequence, it's called it the Constituent Act, you know, was uh, was adopted and uh, uh, African Union was officially proclaimed in 2000. Uh, there, they have a, a, a wonderful rule, a wonderful procedure and rule that all African nations have agreed upon. And that is, uh, that is explained in Article 30. It says that, it says that uh, no force in Africa is allowed to come to power illegally. I will explain why, why I, I want to start with Article 30. Meaning that, let's say, what happened in Ethiopia in November 3rd and 4th is a certain regional power, which was a national power before for 27 years, went back to its base, reassessed and got ready two and a half years, defied federal national order, crisis started, and the objective was coming to Ethiopia, was um, coming to the center and assuming national power. That is unacceptable by the African Union, unacceptable. Articles and uh, acceptable. And uh, by Article 30, any sovereign, any group, be it military or what have you, that comes to power illegally and assumes power is automatically suspended. You want evidence? The Sudan went two years ago, even less than two years ago. The military, when it came to power in Sudan, it was suspended. Mm. So the condition of being accepted by the African Union is that the government in power should be what? A legitimate government. So that's one cardinal principle that we need to, uh, we need to, uh, to, to explain. Therefore, Coming back to the Ethiopian Northern crisis, the federal government took action and African Union supported it. Why? Because in the, in the Constitutive Act, it is openly declared that each sovereign African government has the right to do what? To maintain law and order in its sovereign territorial area. And it was clearly put by the African Union Secretary General that was uh, what happened? The African Union, literally one would say with one voice, supported the actions of the federal government of Ethiopia to maintain law and order in the northern part of, uh, part of Ethiopia. So the African Union was behind it. The same thing for the IGAD, IGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. Literally all of them in the recent, in the, in the recent me meeting in Djibouti, they supported saying that the Ethiopian government has every right to maintain law and order in the country and to bring to justice those illegal groups that, that had opted to use the violent means of coming to power and not the peaceful means of coming to power. So this is clear. And, and there are examples uh, like uh, other, like say Mali was suspended from the African Union because the military came to power or whatever military force. Uh, there are other examples, like uh, Central African Republic. Uh, there are scores of African states which were suspended from the African Union. So uh, African Union is very, very strict when it comes to any group, any group, like say the TPLF or any kind of a group who aspires to do what? To observe or to control state power by force. Nobody will recognize it. Immediately, Ethiopia would have been suspended had that happened. So, and I, 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 I think the African Union and IGAD, they have shown their maturity. They have shown their maturity in non interfering in the sovereign rights of countries, as well as to, to do what? To underline the fact that no illegal force in Africa, no more by military coup or by military action would control national state power and be recognized as a member, to continue as a member in the AU. It will be suspended. Well, Professor, let's also talk about the little Ethiopia uh, that has been recognized by the United States of America. You guys are celebrating the recognition given by the Washington, D.C. Council. Now, tell me a little bit about Ethiopia. And I know that uh, you have played a great contribution for the recognition. I'm, I'm really happy because you asked me this question because a whole lot of efforts went into that. Yes, it's true. Just a few days back, 
um, a certain neighborhood, a certain part of uh, Washington, D.C., 9th Street and U. If you guys know that the whole area around that area, 9th Street, U Street, up to 12th Street, that neighborhood now is officially renamed as Little Ethiopia. And all of us are thrilled and happy. All of us are really happy. It took the Ethiopian community 20 years, 20 years to bring into success uh, the, the certain part of uh, uh, districts, the historical dist district of Washington, D.C. Benin. And as you have pointed out, uh, I was involved in that uh, in two, from 2001 to 2004. I was at the time uh, a senior diplomat of Ethiopia, uh, stationed in Washington, D.C. And I was working hand in hand with the Ethiopian community. Some members are still there. I could name names. Uh, it, the idea died down. I, I left to Europe on another assignment after that. And uh, I tried to follow what was going on between, I believe, 2005, 2004, until 2009. The idea was uh, hanging up in the air. And guess what? The committee once again reconstituted itself. In 2009, they tried again. And they succeeded in 2020, December. That's remarkable. That's remarkable. And guess what? Uh, you might. There are certain neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. that are historically famous, African-Americans and others, music uh, clubs and the like. Uh, like, I think, uh, uh, well-known African-American, uh, you know, big band players and the like. They used to play there in that part of the D.C. And it was not easy. You had to convince the residents who live there in that area. It was not easy because they also are a part of that history. And the Tepe community is a new community. I mean, it came 40 years ago, 35 years ago to America, the second home. So finally, it, uh, it, it, it took uh, this much, 20 years, but uh, success is sweet, but the road might be bumpy. Uh, and uh, we are glad that uh, now, uh, for always, any Ethiopian, future generation and you when you come you guys come to america you have a place to visit and all tourists to visit called little ethiopia and one last point on that uh, it's the second city los angeles succeeded before washington dc in shorter a time if you go to los angeles there is a neighborhood called little ethiopia there and we want to continue as a wish as an ethiopian american in seattle in atlanta in denver in uh, North Carolina, in, in uh, New York, and other places. I do hope in the, uh, our community, wherever we live, in bigger numbers. I congratulate all Ethiopians uh, who worked hard on that, and I congratulate all Ethiopian Americans, and I congratulate also uh, all Ethiopians for this success. And thank you for really uh, raising this very, very current question. Thank you so much. Well, Professor, Thank you so much for your perspectives, and I wish you great success as you keep on the great job that you are doing. Thank you so much, Mr. Farrow, for having me. Well, dear viewers, that was Professor Brook Hailu talking to us in this edition of Addis Dialogue. Thank you so much for your company so far, and till I see you next time with another program, it's goodbye from me. Shifara Bye-bye.